what would you do if you found out your war hero grandfather was not actually a hero at all, but he was responsible for the deaths of thousands of Jews. Eight to 15,000, to be specific. In this conversation, I speak to Sylvia Foti, who is an author, journalist, and teacher, and she has written a memoir about her grandfather and its relevancy to the Holocaust. Her grandfather, she had learned for most of her life, was a hero, and she's been writing this book over the last 20 years, gathering information and traveling and, you know, being a journalist and writing the book to what it is today, where she has recounting a first-hand discovery of her family's history and actually how the Lithuanian government is responsible for propagating the culpability of their responsibility in the Holocaust. And so this story goes much deeper than one woman's memoir of her grandfather not being a hero that the Lithuanian government said he was, but being actually a someone who had ordered the the killings of thousands of Jews. No, her discovery seemed to undo a, a national narrative, or is undoing a national narrative in Lithuania, which converted Holocaust villains like Sylvia's grandfather into war heroes. This disturbing story begs questions of Sylvia. And her readers, how does one's family past, shameful or noble, shape our identity? And why are some European countries like Lithuania in denial about their responsibility in the Holocaust, which now Lithuania has had multiple lawsuits being foisted against them for the genocidal misinformation that they are propagating? Why was this kept a secret until now? Why is this relevant to history? Because as Sylvia poignantly points out in this conversation, if we don't learn from history, then it is likely to repeat itself. And so this conversation is about telling her story and then uncovering its relevancy to one's identity, to the Holocaust, to history. I believe history is really important. You know, so I will continue to have, and I'm fascinated to have conversations with people like Sylvia who are standing up for the truth in spite of an overwhelming number of people who either don't want to hear it or are afraid of it or would rather the convenient narratives that they have been told most of their life because it it's not painful. And so... I hope you enjoy the following conversation with Sylvia Foti. All links will be in the description to buy her book and hear more of her story. Enjoy. Let's give some context for, for those first who don't know before we start talking about identity. I know you've talked about this a few times. Um, I've watched a couple of your podcasts or at least interviews you were on. Um, can you please tell the story of the moment you realized your grandfather wasn't who he thought you were, uh, he was. Sure. Um, I grew up in Chicago, uh, 1960s. And at that time, uh, all I knew, all anyone knew was that my grandfather, Jonas Nareka was a famous world war two hero who fought against the communists and he fought against the communists twice in 1941, uh, in a five day, five-day uprising in Jamaitia, the lowlands, the northwestern part of Lithuania, and uh, they won. They got the communists out. And then in 1946, he fought against the communists again, and this time he lost. And of course, communism took over Lithuania in a very brutal occupation for the next 50 years. So uh, in 1946, when he got caught, he was caught by the KGB, and then he was taken into the KGB prison and he was tortured and interrogated and then uh, executed at the age of 36. So, and then the only other uh, thing I heard was that he was in a Nazi concentration camp. 
So, uh, so to me, you know, this was a legendary figure, you know, a martyr who died for Lithuania's freedom. And that's essentially uh, all I knew. I did hear he was head of the Shole district. What was the Shole yes. district? It uh, is the second largest region of Lithuania. Okay. And um, so this this part comes in a little later. This is this was still a hole in the story for me. Um, so um, so anyway, my mother had been working on this book about her father ever since I could remember, and this was her project. And the Lithuanian community here in Chicago expected her to finish it. And um, and then in the year two thousand, she got very sick. And uh, she was only 60 years old. And, you know, every, I expected her to live another 20, 30 years, certainly. And um, anyway, um, she looked really, really bad. And she called me over to her bedside in the hospital. And she said, Sylvia, you have to write the book. And, um, you know, at first I said, no, 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 you're going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. You know, you, you're going to come out okay. Uh, but she wasn't. And she said, no, you have to do it. Everybody's expecting it. So um, so that's how I got the project, was to write the story that she never finished about her wonderful father. So anyway, um, that she died in February 2000. And then, um, then in July 2000, her mother, my grandmother, was now on her deathbed. And um, she calls me over and she says, Sylvia, how's the book? Because she had heard I took it over. And I said, fine, you know, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to let it go the way mom did. At that time, I was 38 years old. And I said, I'm young. You know, I'm a journalist. I'm going to get it done. I'm not going to let it go the way mom did. Yeah. And she says, don't write the book. Just let history lie. And I'm like, what? I mean, I promised mom, of course I'm going to write the book. What are you saying? Not even, you know, having a remotest idea of why she would say something like this. I thought she was just trying to let me off the hook. Really, that's all I thought. So anyway, then um, she dies. And now uh, both of them wanted to be buried in Lithuania. And so my brother, who lives in California, and I took them both to Lithuania, buried them there. And then shortly after that, we were invited in the school named after our grandfather, the Jonas Noreko Grammar School, which is in Chukone, Lithuania. And um, at that grammar school, I was greeted very grandly by the director, by the children. They were holding flowers and singing Lithuanian folk songs. And then um, it's not even noon and, and the Lithuanian director office offers us beer, which we can't refuse. And so we're drinking beer before noon. And um, and then he's showing me the scrapbook of uh, my grandfather, Jonas Noreka. And, and then he says, thank you so much. You know, I heard that you're writing this book that you took over this project for your mom. Uh, our country really needs heroes. We really need to understand these stories. And I said, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, as long as I'm here, why don't you tell me what happened? How how you ended up naming the school after my grandfather? And he says, um, well, you know, we had a horrible Russian name before. And we wanted to get rid of that terrible Russian name and put in a good patriotic Lithuanian name. And your grandfather's name came up because he was born here. And I said, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I thought that would be the end of the story. But then he says, um, but you know, I got a lot of grief over naming the school after your grandfather. And I said, grief from who? And he says, grief from the Jews. And I said, what could the Jews possibly say about my wonderful grandfather? And he says, he was accused of killing Jews. And uh, he said it so matter of factly as if like it was such common knowledge. Um, so like, So like the words, hit me like 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 a ton of bricks and his tone of voice also really affected me and anyway that was the first time i ever heard this i was completely unprepared for this did you believe I, him um 
I don't think I did, but I was still very affected by it, you know, because I just didn't, I, I, I had a hard time believing it. I had to sit down and he says, but don't worry, it's just communist propaganda. And so um, I go back home to Chicago, you know, completely stunned by this. And I start talking to people here, like my father and that generation. And, and I said, have you ever heard this crazy rumor about Jonas Nareka being accused of killing Jews? And they said, yeah, we heard it. I'm like, what? How come everybody knows about this except me? And, and they said, well, it's not true. It's just communist propaganda. Why would we talk about something that's a complete and total lie? So um, I kind of went along with that for many years. And I also embraced that lie that it was just communist propaganda because that's so much easier to uh, take in than the idea that your grandfather was involved in killing innocent people. What were the first most compelling pieces of evidence that made you think, okay, this isn't propaganda, this actually is real? Like, I think there was a couple of different pieces that were the most, like, two of them, I believe? You're right, yeah. So the first was something that he wrote himself. Uh, he wrote it in 1933 when he was in the Lithuanian army, and it's called... Uh, in Lithuanian, Pakel Galvalietuvi, or Raise Your Head Lithuanian. And, um, you know, when, when I first found it in my mother's archive, and it was kind of not, I mean, it was just kind of thrown in randomly somewhere. So, like, I really found it very late, you know, many years later. And when I was trying to go through every single piece of paper that she had very methodically. And then I, I kind of found it tucked in where it didn't make any sense to me. Anyway, um, <clears throat> that, uh, he wrote like a, like a 32 page brochure, I guess. And in this 32 page brochure, he is essentially calling for the boycott of anything made by Jews. And he says, Lithuania is for Lithuanians. Uh, the Jews are the foreigners. Why, why do they have all the best positions? You know, why are we buying their products? We need to buy products from Lithuanians. Lithuania is from Lithuania. Um, it's about time we stand up for ourselves and, and stop having these foreigners run our country. So it was like this for 32 pages. Was this like, a, like an article for a newspaper, like a journal? Like, who is this supposed to be for? It, it, was, a, it was a standalone booklet. 32 page little booklet. Was this just for himself? Uh, like his own writing? Like he, it was published, um, by, by a group in Kauna. So it would be like, okay. it would have been passed around. Got it. Got it. You got know, it. Like a little booklet. Okay. Go so, on. um, so, uh, to me, it's like Lithuania's little Mein Kampf. Right. It was written, uh, you know, uh, mein Kampf was in 26, so seven years, seven years after Mein Kampf. So he must have read Mein Kampf, and he he read he spoke German. In fact, he was a German translator for the Nazis um, during the Nazi occupation huh. uh, as part of his position. So um, and and so this really clued me into how anti-Semitic he was already in 1933 you know, uh, eight years before the Holocaust came aboard. And so in the, it, one thing, though, that I sort of clung to was that he didn't call for the killing of Jews. He just he just called for the, you know, economic boycott of their goods. And um, and then in pencil on the cover, my grandmother had written 22 year old young man. And it's as if, like, I could see my grandmother stand up before me to kind of defend her husband and to say, uh, look, he was just 22. He was a hothead. You know, nobody knows what they're doing when they're 22 yet. You can't take this seriously. So I sort of, like, took it that way for a while until I couldn't even take it that way anymore. And when was that? Uh, and that's... Because then I came across another document uh, that was also in my mother's archives. It was in a book, a Holocaust book of Holocaust documents. 
And uh, one of them was uh, an order that he signed when he was uh, head of the Cholet district during the Nazi occupation. So in, Sh in this Cholet district, the second largest region of Lithuania at the time, he, was, he had the highest position a Lithuanian could have under a Nazi. So he had a very high position and he was like living in the equivalent of the governor's mansion. It was like he was the governor of the, of the area under a Nazi. And, um, and this order called for the rounding up of all Jews and half Jews in the region of Chole and that they'd be brought to uh, a new ghetto that need, needed to be newly created in Jagadim, which is this tiny town in Northern Lithuania that borders Latvia. And um, he said all these Jews and half, he wrote it August 22nd, 1941. And they all had to be in Jagare within one week by August 29th, 1941. And um, it didn't take me long to research what happened to these Jews. It was like 2,000 that were brought uh, to this newly formed ghetto. And they were all massacred on Yom Kippur. Hmm. I think today's Yom Kippur. Oh, today? The, I think today's Yom Kippur in the Jewish calendar, as it turns out. Oh, wow. What a uh, uh, serendipitous um, day to yes. do that. I just I just thought of this. So they so uh, they were all killed on Yom Kippur in Jagadim. Yeah, it's the sixteenth, um, and you're in Chicago, which is a day behind me, and that's today. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm in Chicago. I'm behind. Where are you, London? Melbourne, Australia. Oh, Melbourne. Oh, I didn't even know where you were. There you go. <laughs> where did you, you thought I was in um, the UK? I did. I somehow I thought you were in London. I don't know why. No, that's okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's um. I, I love when things line up like that. Okay, so you find these two pieces of evidence. Yeah. So, uh, you want to keep talking about that? I think you had you wanted to close that out. Yeah. So this is what um, really that document changed everything for me by that you know by that point I was about 10 years into the project uh, at about the halfway point and I had done a lot of research about how he fought against the communists and how terrible the communists were and I kind of he wrote a fairy tale from the Stutthof concentration camp I was like doing all the I mean it was a lot of work but it was psychologically easy for me because it was all positive information about my grandfather and I was like keeping the, the rumor, the Nazi occupation stuff, like when I would be stronger and ready to deal with it. So when I came across this document, I really, it changed me. It just, it just like all the scales fell from my mind and I had nothing left to cling to. And I thought, this is it. He really was uh, involved in the Holocaust in Lithuania. And now I need to find out was he forced to sign this document? You know, was he at gunpoint or something, you know, or what? What were the circumstances behind this? Or was he a willing participant? It, I, actually, I don't remember you speaking about that. Maybe I'm just forgetting. But what were the circumstances that brought him to make that decision and order the killings of thousands of Jews? Like, did you ever get clarity on whether that, on what that was? Well... I had to put a lot of documents together and a lot of circumstances together and a lot of interviews together. And um, I think he willingly took this position uh, to be uh, chief of the Cholet district during the Nazi occupation. Nobody forced him to do that. And um, in fact, the guy before who had that position stepped down, voluntarily just stepped down but this man was in his 50s. And I think, you know, maybe when you're in your 50s, you're a little wiser than somebody like my grandfather who was just 30. And I think the the guy in his 50s saw the writing on the wall and understood what he would be doing. Whereas my, my grandfather, I think, was a little bit more, I don't know, not as wise. I don't want to say gullible because I think he knew what he was getting something himself into and then he knew what he would be doing but he just he he was caught up in all of the uh nazi propaganda and all the anti-semitism 
that that was common in Lithuania and, and throughout Europe in this sense. And um, the Nazis were very, very successful at, at creating this myth that all Jews were communists and that all Jews were dangerous. And even the babies and the grandmothers, you got it. You got to kill them too, because they're, they're bad. And somehow this, this virulency against the Jews somehow became justified with this uh, internal logic that every single Jew was a danger. Hmm. Well, what do you then do with this? Like, how long, I, I know you commented, you, you went into a bit of a depression for a period of time to, to kind of comprehend this. Um, but what do you, how do you manage that, like internally? Like, how did you do your own, I don't know if you want to call it soul searching reflection on your own ancestry and the lies that were propagated to you? Um, it was very difficult, to be honest. Uh, I had a very difficult time wrapping my head around this. Um, and I did, I did go in, into a depression and I did, um, want to just give up. I just wanted to throw the manuscript away and, you know, not, not keep my promise to my mother. And by this point it was looking like, you know, the book my mother wanted me to write was not the book that was going to happen anyway. Um, and so I tried to drop it. I tried to drop this project and, uh, time would go by and it was like a magnet. It just like kept drawing me back to it. It was like, I couldn't drop it. And, um, you know, the, I think it was like the granddaughter in me was fighting against the journalist in me. And, uh, uh. The journalist kept saying, this is a really good story. There's a lot of information that's here that you got to investigate. You should really, you know, figure this out about your grandfather. And, and, you know, the granddaughter in me, like, just wanted to, you know, <laughs> crawl under a table in a fetal position and, and suck my thumb and say, no, no, go away. I don't want to do this. But um, the journalist prevailed uh, in the end, um, something powerful has to be pulling you there because you could have ignored it just, and you could have just accepted it as propaganda. You could have fallen for, you know, what a lot of other Lithuanians are just accepting now. And they're coming to terms with some of the, the work you're putting out there and they're not accepting it. And maybe they are, they are under the table sucking their thumb, but you <laughs> chose not to. And there has to be some force driving you towards, I don't know what it is. I don't want to put words in your mouth. What is that force? Well, um, I am a practicing Catholic okay. and I think this is, this faith that I have is, is strong. I have a very strong belief and a strong faith mm -hmm. and, um, it's my compass. It's my internal compass that I, that I follow no matter who I am, the granddaughter or the journalist, whoever I am. Um, and so I think this, you know, I prayed over this every single day of my life, many times a day, and I still do. Mm. And I, I kept telling myself, if this is the truth, God, if this is the truth, you got to help me get the story out because, and you have to give me the strength to do this, but I can only do so much. I mean, the rest, you're going to have to help me. And so I just had that faith. I felt like I wasn't alone in um, pursuing this. And I mean, really, I had no other help, no other human help for a long time. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, me and God and the, and the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. <laughs> and that's it. And, um, and that's what I relied on the most. And so, uh, and then of course the journalist would kick in and I would just get down to business and I would start reading and going over everything I could and then lining up interviews and and putting the pieces together like that. 
And now you're here, the book is fine. I mean, how does it feel? Like, this is something that's been such an important part of you for so long. I would imagine, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine it would be very relieving to finally take a breath and just be like, it's out there, it's done, now people can really understand. Yeah, I mean, um, I am I am immensely relieved. You know, not only did I write the book, but then I wanted it to get a good publisher. Yeah. And that was a whole other uh, ball of wax to figure Well, you got out. rejected... I don't know, a few times? Like, a lot of great authors do, and a lot of great books do end up being rejected their first couple times. Yeah, I would say it was more than two. It was, like, about 100. Really? In the 20 years. Wow. Uh, you kept it was persisting. A lot of, I, it was a lot of... And every time I got rejected... You know, what? one thing I knew as a writer that when you get rejected, it's not, it's not them, it's you. <laughs> and so... <laughs> <laughs> okay. What did you learn through that process? What was it about you so and the I learned, story? I, I learned that I have to get better at my writing yeah, yeah. and and that I have to figure out how to tell the story. Uh, and so I switched careers. I switched careers from being a, uh, from being a full-time journalist and then I became a high school teacher so that I could have my summers off to work on this. And then I got my third master's degree uh, an MFA in creative nonfiction. And this is kind of the technical piece of it because um, like, like there's psychological hurdles, spiritual hurdles. And then there was this big technical hurdle of how to, how to write the story because journalism, the training I had at Northwestern in the eighties was uh, very objective, very neutral. You keep yourself out of it. You don't put your personal stuff in there. And that was kind of the only style I knew. And it and that was the style I was trying to apply to write the story. I was going to try to write it as a third person biography. But it was like a big piece of the truth was missing and that the granddaughter was struggling with all this information. And um and it and that style was just not ringing true. It just and and the literary agents could smell it a mile away. And it just wasn't working. And so um, when I entered this program for my MFA in creative nonfiction, right away, like within the first week, the professors were advising me, no, 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 this is not a biography. You got to make this a memoir. I'm like, a memoir? What's a memoir? <laughs> like, like it was right. I mean, I read them, but I've never written one. So you've had to flip and, the whole style of how you wrote. Yes, I had to. I, yes. I mean, I went to school to learn how to do it. I mean, I know there are some writers who are geniuses who just figure this out on their own, but I had to go to school to figure it to help me. And uh, and so and. You know, creative nonfiction takes into like account, like how do you write a, an interesting narrative? How do you write a scene? How, how do you write immerse immersively so that you're a character the reader cares about. How do you write your emotions and feelings in there? Yeah. How do you create suspense? You know, how do you like how do you structure it? So all of that really was like the technique behind it that really helped me too. I wonder, but anytime you learn a new skill and, and you have to force yourself to refine a skill set and, and just restructure the way you conduct yourself, you learn a bit about yourself. I wonder, has writing and this process of writing and self-reflection and writing this memoir taught you or revealed anything about who you are and yourself? It did. This whole this whole project just became so consuming in almost every single aspect of my life. And um, it really changed me. And um, it taught me I have a lot of grit. And it taught me I have a lot of resilience. Mm -hmm. And it taught me I have a lot a lot of faith. And um, it taught me that I could persevere. And it taught me I had more courage than I thought I ever did. Do you think that sounds like almost... Do you think that's also the utility of writing? Like, 
if writing could have a purpose, like self-reflective writing, journaling, even writing your own kind of memoir reflection, like, would you encourage people to write or find a way to write? Um, or is it too almost burdensome to to uh, go down that path for some people? I'm not sure. Like, is this something you would encourage other people to, to do? Right. I've always wanted to be a writer since I was in eighth grade. Uh-huh. Um, so, which is why I became a journalist, you know, and so I've always wanted, so writing was my thing always. I always wanted to be a writer Mm. and, um, writing is my, my lifesaver always. It really, cause I can, I don't know what my mind until I write it down. It's like, I have to, I like somehow when I just, talk it's not the same as getting on a you know now on a computer and typing uh but even i like to handwrite and then which is like a really rough draft and then i'll like type it out and then fix it and fix and then i i really get a lot more clarity in my thinking yeah and um writing really you know i i'm an english teacher now and to my high school students and really they all hate writing essays in my every there's not a I mean there's like you know of my 150 students maybe three like to write the essays mm. everybody else complains about it because it's hard work and writing is thinking and yes. you cannot get away with fuzzy thinking in an essay you really have to get you have to have a thesis statement mm. and it has to connect all the way through a memoir of, and any book has to do that I, that's brilliant. I, I, it forces you to cr- like make your thoughts coherent, logical. You have to critically, well, you should, and you usually are forced to at least critically think out your own thoughts because, and once you put, because after, for me, I, I was, I think I was one of those kids who, one of the rare kids, like, yeah, you don't like being forced to do things, like write essays on topics you're not interested in, but... I actually credit those English class essays to stimulating a fascination with writing and self-reflection. And after high school, over the last, whatever, eight years, I have been, 10 years, I have been written 150 different pieces, just whatever it is, self-reflective memoirs, um, just different pieces on on philosophy and psychology. And I credit that to one of the best things to refine my own thinking and ideas so i couldn't encourage it enough and i'm glad to hear you you know have a similar uh, feeling yeah i mean that's one thing i teach in my english classes uh because nobody understands the importance of you know why are we reading hamlet and why do we have to talk about you know this character and shakespeare and 400 years ago um and it doesn't matter what sub what I mean Hamlet you can't go wrong but it doesn't matter what the subject is once you you wrap your your mind around a character or a theme or what's happening and then you go with it yeah. and you analyze it and you provide evidence for it and it's and hopefully it's original and um, it changes it changes you it empowers you when you when you write something like that it makes you feel powerful that's beautiful. I really like that. I, but um, I actually want to backtrack a little bit because I only heard you brought, bring this up once about you visiting the burial sites of the Jews that your grandfather was responsible for killing. I'd love to know what that was like and like the story that led up to that and what you're feeling when you're walking around that area knowing what occurred on here. Um, yeah, I hired, uh, you know, when I, f- how, I don't, sorry, it's like I have five different ways of entering the story. Yeah. Um, it's okay. When I, when I was finishing up my MFA in creative nonfiction, they let me use this as my thesis, yeah. the story. Yeah. It's completely different from the book, but anyway, it was a good start. And when they, they said, and I thought I was done. But then they said, you've just begun, Sylvia. What you have to do now is go to Lithuania and conduct your own investigation. 
like, what? You know, so, um, so I set up a big research trip, seven week research trip in 2013. And as part of that, uh, as I was setting things up, I have a really good friend in Chicago uh, who used to work for the Sun-Times, Howard Walensky. And he calls me up one day and he, he's been following me, you know, on this project, like since the, since before I thought my, like, since I thought my grandfather was a hero and then he like kind of was with me with all this. And anyway, he says, um, I just came back from a Holocaust tour in Lithuania. And I'm like, I had never heard of such a thing. What's a Holocaust tour in Lithuania? He's like, well, you know, it's where Jews hire a Holocaust guide and uh, the guide takes them to all the places he thinks their relatives might be buried. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Howard, this sounds terrible. I just, this sounds so sad. He's like, I know, but it's a thing. We do it. And then we pray Kaddish and um, I'm like, oh my gosh, I had no idea this was going on in Lithuania. So anyway, um, we hang up. And then I'm like imagining Howard and his family like going from site to site and like visiting these unmarked graves and wondering if their relatives are there or not and kind of going through the emotions of how they were killed. And, and then I had a crazy idea <clears throat> and I call up Howard and I said, Howard, I have a really crazy idea. I don't know what you're going to think about it. And he says, what? And I says, and I said, what do you think if I talk to your Holocaust guide and I ask him to take me on a tour in Lithuania of the Holocaust sites where maybe my grandfather was involved in killing Jews? He says, Sylvia, that's a terrible idea. It's a really terrible, crazy idea. It's so crazy, though, I think it's good. <laughs> And he says, I don't know. I'll ask him. I don't know how he's going to feel about it. And so anyway, he asked him. It's, and at first, Simon Dovidovichus, who at the time was uh, the director of the Sugihara Museum in Kaunas, said no. He has no interest in taking, you know, a perpetrator's granddaughter to these kind of sites. He has no interest. And a few weeks later, he contacts me and he says, your grandfather's Jonas Nareka? I said, yeah. And he says, you know, I've been doing a lot of research on him and he's a very interesting character. I'm getting drawn into his story despite myself. And I think I want to do this crazy thing with you. So I'm like, okay, Simon. So, um, so as part of my research tour, he's the one I was with Simon when he took me to where he thought, uh, the Jews were buried that my grandfather was involved in. And one very f famous place is in Plunga, where this was before my grandfather um, was even, you know, head of the district of Shell. It was like one month before, one to two months before, like June 22nd to August 4th, he was in Plunga. And because then August 4th, he became head of the uh, Shaolay district. So, in Plunga, and this was there were only like one or two Nazis there. All the two thousand Jews were killed, and there was a live witness, um, Alexander Spokalnishkis, who wrote a memoir, and he was my grandfather's secretary, and he wrote that my grandfather ordered the murder of all those Jews, and so. Um, Simon took me to this famous site now in Koshanla. They have an uh, annual memorial every year, like since the 80s, I think. And um, I was there in 2013, and I felt very strange um, because everybody there kind of was whispering and looking at me, and uh, they knew who I was. Like Simon had told them, and it it kind of went through the whole group, and I, I had the sense that I, I had, I should step up and apologize or say something, but I just, I just didn't. It just, I don't know, I didn't. 
And, um, but I put a stone on, on that site, which is what Jews do. And uh, as a sign of respect. And I felt it was kind of another turning point for me because it was the first time I was at a site so publicly with Jews who knew I was the granddaughter of the man and, you know, responsible for giving the order of killing their, their relatives there. And everybody was very um, respectful. And I think it was like, no words were said yet, but it was like sort of like this really fine moment. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to call it reconciliation, but it was almost there. It was almost there. And uh, it felt very healing for me. And I think in some way it felt very healing for those Jews to have me there. And I just knew that by, by my presence, my physical presence there and my demeanor and my contrition and sense of guilt, like all that helped them. And, uh, and it helped me that it helped them. Mm -hmm. And it just kept this, this beautiful cycle. And so um, it spurred me on to continue with the project. Like it was a very meaningful moment. To, to linger there a little bit, you said you felt the need to apologize. Why didn't you? And why did you feel the need to? Because there is a, there is a, I don't know if, the, I don't know what the answer is, but should we apologize for the wrongdoings of our ancestors? How do you reconcile that question? You are not your grandfather, yet you are related to him and you would not be here without him. What do we do with the fact that some of our ancestors have committed immoral, maybe even evil acts that we would never condone today? Um, I have apologized since then. At that time, I was... I don't know. I just wasn't ready for it. I, I have been apologizing since then. Um, I know I'm not my grandfather. I know I wasn't there. I wasn't even born, mm. but it, I'm just so, um, I don't even know. I don't even know what the word is, but I'm so upset that he's considered a hero when, when, and it's not even clear how many Lithuanians he saved from the communists. It's really not clear. And uh, despite all the evidence of him being involved in killing eight to 15,000 Jews, like that, that much is clear. Hmm. And um, the little that he did for Lithuania and against the communists, to me, does not measure up with the horror that he did against the Jews. And I'm, so, I'm almost apologizing for the government of Lithuania for making him a hero. Oh. In some ways, because that is still current. I want to talk about that, yeah. And, um, you know, the ancestral thing, because I grew up thinking it was the heroes for so long, for 38, you know, 38, 40 years, and then really I didn't accept it until I was almost 50. And, um, like, I'm sorry I thought he was ever a hero. I'm sorry I was fed this lie about him. I'm sorry the government of Lithuania thinks he's a hero. I'm sorry you have to live through the indignity of calling my, you know, in a country that where my grandfather is called a hero. Like, I'm sorry for all of that. And the disturbing thing is, the concerning thing is that the Lithuanian government appears to be covering up the culpability of their responsible for contributing to the Holocaust. Uh, is that accurate? What, what, what do you, what is going on there? Like, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is where as big as the story was, it blew up with right. all this. Right. Um, and so, um, Again, there's like five ways to tell the story. <laughs> what's current? Uh, like what's happening right now? 2021. Well, what's happening right now is 
um, I have to talk, I have to bring up Grant Goshen. Yeah. He uh, is a Jew, uh, a Lithuanian Jew in, in California, originally from South Africa. And he lost a hundred relatives in the Holocaust in the Shole district um, because of my grandfather. And he was so angry that the country is considering my grandfather a hero that he sued. He brought 20 legal actions against Lithuania in all its five courts uh, for Holocaust distortion. And so um, the problem is Lithuania has like this big history think tank called the Genocide and Resistance Research Center. And uh, the government hires like, I don't know, a hundred historians. And these historians are on Lithuania's payroll to look at Lithuania's history, specifically around World War II. The problem is because they're Lithuanian, they're really only interested in looking at how Lithuania was victimized by the Soviet Union. And they have, they had very little interest in going too deeply in the Holocaust and how that happened. As far the what they the, the farthest they went is Lithuania was forced. It's all the Nazis. There were some degenerates who were involved. Um, that's about as far as they got. So um, and this is their block and their the denial that I went through for twenty years. The denial that most Lithuanians are going through. It's pervasive in the Genocide and Resistance Research Center. This is a big psychological block because it's so difficult to take uh, responsibility for something this big. And so um, to me, they screwed up on my grandfather. They based their entire decision on the fact that my grandfather was a hero on the KGB transcripts. And there, this when he was interrogated by the KGB, there are 3,000 pages of those transcripts. Well, in 1946, all the KGB cared about was this rebellion that he was trying to lead against them. They really asked him not a single question about the Jews. And so the Genocide Center basically said, well, because there's no evidence in these KGB transcripts that, that he killed any Jews, he must be innocent. And so let's make him a hero. They just weren't looking for it. They weren't looking for it, and they were really happy they didn't find it. And, um, but, and that those transcripts were in Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania. About an hour north are the Chole archives. Mm. And when we went through the Chole archives, my grandfather signed about a thousand documents when he was chairman of the Chole district. And of those thousand, about a hundred have to do with the Holocaust. And we could only find about three orders written in German. So he wasn't just translating. He was writing them straight into Lithuanian to get these orders done by other Lithuanians. Has and this evidence been presented to the Lithuanian government in those uh, lawsuits that Grant is doing? Yes. And what has their response been? Well, this was their graceful way of finally owning up to it and Lithuania lost its really last chance to do this in a very graceful way because the Lithuanian courts are known to be corrupt hmm. and they sided with the genocide center. In spite of this evidence that Grant was presenting. Yes. Wh they completely why? discounted it. They completely discounted it. They said, I'm not a, I'm not a historian with a PhD. I wasn't born in 19, I wasn't even around in Lithuania in 1941. How could I possibly uh, know what I'm talking about? Uh, just very silly arguments. Those that, okay, be those arguments as they may be, that doesn't discount the evidence that you're using to promote the claims that he was not who they say he is. Right. Well, because of their stance, in believing Lithuania is innocent, um, let's just take this document that my grandfather signed on August 22nd, 1941, which I think is the most damaging 
their excuses, he didn't know what he was signing. Uh, he didn't understand that the, what, what a ghetto was. He didn't really know that they would be killed. Uh, he was just following Nazi orders. It's like every excuse they could possibly come up with, they come up with. Do they have evidence for those claims? That like, How would they know his intentions at the time? Nobody knows his intentions at the time. That's, that's right. It's all, it's all speculation. It's all speculation. And when I was a journalist, you know, I was taught, you just go by the documents. No. His signature is on that document. Boom. Hey, it's a primary source document. And, and, and I interviewed the director of the genocide center when I was there in 2013. She's not there anymore. And, uh, I asked her about that document. And she said, well, it's difficult to know what was in his heart when he was signing that document. It's difficult. It's impossible. Like, of course not. I know. And, and you know, me with my Northwestern training, I'm like, I, I, like, I just walked into the twilight zone. Like, I'm not in Kansas anymore. You know, this is, this is a completely different way of talking about primary source documents. Like, you just don't do this. R right. Right. Very good. Yeah, great point. Man, so obviously it's, it sounds like there's uh, they don't want to take responsibility. And I wonder what are the consequences if they do? Of course, they look they look like they were wrong and no government wants to look like they have to admit error. Of course, that undermines their, their credibility and authority. Or, beyond that, is there any other reasons why they could potentially not be taking responsibility? Could they have to pay reparations? Um is there other some other type of reasoning that they may not want to take responsibility? I think they painted themselves in a corner. And they're just doubling down. And, and they're just doubling down and they don't know how to get out of this corner. And they're damned if they do now and they're damned if they don't. They they had a they had a little opening in these in these courts. If one of the courts would have decided with Grant, they could have all, you know, it could have all ended rather gracefully. But now, Grant um, brought this lawsuit to the uh, European Union International Court of Human Rights. And you can only get there if you've exhausted every single court in the country of origin. He did that. Yeah. That's done. And so now it is in the International Court of Human Rights. And uh, it does have a slim chance of getting heard because it's like it's no, it's like the Supreme Court in the United States. They only hear like one or two percent mm. of cases presented. And I heard in, in the EU, they hear about five percent of the cases presented. So so we have a five percent chance of this even being heard. When will you know? Uh, maybe next year. OK, well, um, if you remember, please, because uh, this won't ma I know. This won't make mainstream media at all. Not at this point. Not unless you get on some really big podcast. Um, and this, this, this just flies off. But uh, I think that's another reason why I wanted to have you on because Lithuanian politics, governance, and even the Holocaust. This stuff isn't talked about now. And so you know that's a big. That's one reason why I wanted to have you on to talk about this stuff and bring light to it. But uh, keep me Thank updated. You. I will. Um, and and we'll see. We will see. Uh, is there? Would it, is now the next step to empower the people? Like, okay, the government may be corrupt and not taking responsibility, but okay, you can empower the millions of Lithuanians to then put pressure on the government. Um, you know, like we've so, seen many times around the world with different issues. Do you see that as the next step with promoting your book, or is that even? a really, really difficult task that overwhelms you as well. Well, that's my hope that that's what, that's what I hope this book is because I knew there's no way this book could have been published in Lithuania uh, originally. Like I knew it had to come in from the United States. Uh, and I knew that the issue had to come in from the outside of Lithuania. I'm Lithuanian enough to know how <laughs> Lithuania works. And, um, and I knew that it would never come from within. It, would, it could only come from without. Um, so my hope is that this book and Grant's lawsuit brings enough pressure from the outside and uh, enlightens, you know, 
as many Lithuanians as possible. They have to get over this denial, though. Uh, so, so this could take a while. Yeah, because it took. It, it's like really the last, I think, ten years since you got that initial piece of compelling evidence you had to digest. But it's been about six months since your book's been out, and it takes some time to reach a reach a larger population. How do you? To go back on the first question I asked you, you said that they're lukewarm. What's the main criticisms and of the book and are people reading it? Are they ignoring it entirely and not even wanting to, to acknowledge it? Are there some who are really thankful? What's the like, ratio of this? I think... Um, in general, they're trying to ignore it and hope it just goes away. Um, some Lithuanians who have read it were upset that it makes Lithuania look bad and that I didn't spend enough time talking about how terrible the Soviet Union was to Lithuania. And, um, you know, my own response is all Lithuania has ever written about is the Soviet Union and how terrible the Soviet Union was that this is like actually new information. Okay. And so I didn't want to, and it's already 400 pages long, like to include the whole Soviet Union thing would have been another 400 pages. And that's been done. Mm. That has been done by Lithuanians. That It's not like that's never been covered. This is new. This is new. Um, one, one criticism is that I'm not a PhD in history. It's never enough, is it? And I'm like, well, if only the PhDs in history had done their job. <laughs> Right, because they are the historians hired by the Lithuanian government to right. talk about this. Right, but I am a journalist. I mean, you know. No, there, there is credibility, I, Sylvia. I can, I, I can think critically. Absolutely. <laughs> like, you have a track record. Like, you've been teaching and have been a journalist for, for ages. Like, at some point, yes, of course, more letters behind your name add some credibility, but there's more to it than that. There is a... It's not just the... The degree, it's also the merit and quality and the character behind the individual. Yeah, and then their third um, complaint is that the story gets too personal. Isn't it a memoir? It's a memoir. So it's like they don't understand memoir. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, when you initially wrote it, I get it. Like It was like, what's a memoir? Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Yeah, so it's like they don't get met, like somehow they thought it should be written like, you know, a history book. And I'm like, well, it's not. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think memoir. And you, you initially tried to do the third person thing, but you couldn't get published like that. So. Right. And if, if you're the granddaughter, you know, really, uh, note, note to any writer out there, if you're the granddaughter of somebody who did something horrible, you're going to have to make it a memoir. <laughs> mm. I see. I see. Okay. I see those three main criticisms, though. Okay. It's good to acknowledge them. I'm glad at least you don't ignore them and you talk about them and respond to them. Um, on a more personal note, like, I think giving empathy and compassion is to, to see what it was like to be in their shoes. If you were to put yourself in your grandfather's shoes, like, what, what reason would you attribute? If he had to justify himself today, like, what do you think he would say from your perspective to why he did what he did? I think his perspective would be, I was trying to save Lithuania. I wanted Lithuania to be free. Lithuania's independence was paramount. And uh, I was caught between two opposing military behemoths, you know, the Nazis, and the communists, and I thought I would be safer uh, joining with the, uh, hello, am yeah, I there? Yeah, I'm here, I got you. I lo oh, I would be safer joining with uh, the Nazis, and um, he, he was anti-Semitic though, so like I would say, he would probably say, and the Jews, were known to be communists. This was a very common belief. Um, How much truth was there behind that? What, do we have any understanding of the percentage of communist Jews? Yeah. Well, there were communist Jews, but they, it, there were a lot of Lithuanian communists 
too, though. And so, um, but proportionately, you know, percentage wise, um, like Jews take up 10% of the country. Yep. And then at the time, yep. now it's even less. And then, you know, Lithuanians 90%. And I, so there were 10% more Jewish communists. More than 10% of Jewish communists, of all the communists. Okay. I don't know what the number is. I mean, like, it wasn't much higher. I, I don't know what the number, I don't even want to make it up. Yeah. But it wasn't much higher than 10%. But because proportionately there were more Jews, percentage-wise, it they took, you know, the problem with Jews is you have one bad Jew, and it stands for every single Jew in the in the world. Why do you think that is? Do you think that that's when it began during the Holocaust? Well, I think this has been since time immemorial. I mean, it, the anti-Semitism is all, has, is just there all the time. And if you can take one bad apple and and apply it to the whole group, you will. If you're if you have that anti-Semitic prejudice. It that seems like a flaw of the human species. It's what we do. We we take it doesn't matter what ethnicity or religion, right? This is applicable across the whole spectrum, it seems. It does. But somehow with Jews, people just want to kill them. Like it's like it's terrible. What do you like what do we make of then the Holocaust? Like it's a big question. I don't uh, know. <laughs> but I'll I'll try and get a little bit <laughs> more specific, but in your reflection and your studies and your life, when when you've thought about the Holocaust and even thinking about it now, what lessons does that reveal about humanity to you? I don't know. Um, as a Lithuanian, it really opened my eyes to the shadow side of Lithuania. Uh, until I started researching all this, I really had this fairy tale image of Lithuanians as just beautiful people, poetic poor victims, you know, always downtrodden, never having a chance, like the little country that could, uh, that was kind of my view. And so when I really started to see how, how many Lithuanians were involved in killing Jews and how pervasive this was and how close this was to me with my own grandfather, I really got a strong sense of just this horrible, dark, ugly side. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I teach Lord of the Flies to my freshmen mm. by William Golding, uh, who, who wrote it right after World War II. And, uh, and I think you know, he he based it on these children being shuttled off into this island like a kinder action. And, um, but these children were left without any supervision, without any um, supports. And human nature can go really evil if, there, if there's not some kind of a policing support, but then you have to depend on the police to be good. Um, you have to, you know, so much of our society depends on our morals. Mm. I mean, even laws, if you, you can, you can follow a lot of the letter and you could still hurt people while you're doing that. Mm -hmm. If you're not, if you don't have this, more, you know, a moral compass, I guess. And uh, humanity is very fragile that way. We're so trusting that everybody is going to be good. And, you know, we just believe that somehow things are going to work out. And then when they don't. 
we learn? We're in Shaq. Yeah, but I think it was Alexander Scholznitsyn, maybe who said this, but the line between good and evil runs between every human heart. You yes. Know, I, I think that's... I think largely it's a choice of where you want to sit on that line and the decisions you make. And I don't know if I necessarily even blame a lot of the historical uh, perpetrators of evil. You can very easily, but a lot of the times it's just a slow, incremental drip towards what we see as the output of the Holocaust. Like, it didn't begin like that. It begins slowly with the persecution of Jews. Slowly, Jews were first, you know, um, you can't, I can't remember all the details, but first, like, that, you can't congregate in the same areas together, Jews and um, just general population, non-Jews, right? And then you, there's a curfew, and then this, and then this, and then all of a sudden, they're getting round up and put in concentration. But that's a slow kind of, and I think some people are concerned about this time now because, ooh, where does this go? Like the current time we're living in now, like how far does this go? How does power get, um, how do people take advantage of the power they currently have now? And I think, you know, the rhythms of history teach us, teach us this. And uh, it's just a fascinating thought. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the Holocaust happened uh initially incrementally mm. and then it got to the point where uh and, you know and everybody spoke in euphemisms and it got to the point where um the final solution was just accepted do as you, as a necessity do you recall because i'm struggling to remember like the the steps of like what was the first uh i don't know if you know the first steps of discrimination against Jews or, or laws and rules against Jews versus non-Jews. Do you remember? Well, first it was just the anti-Semitic propaganda. So that, that laid the groundwork for years and years. And what were they uh, saying just, in that propaganda? Um, if you remember. I don't, I don't remember, but it was something like, it was definitely othering them. And, and calling them all Bolsh Bolsheviks and communists and dangerous and uh, greedy. And and then these there were these myths about Jews. I wrote about this in my book, The Blood Libel, that to this day is still believed by some people in like, Lithuania. Like what? Like what myths? The blood libel is uh, where uh, it... If a Lithuanian kid went missing, like just lost, everyone would blame, would blame it, the kid being kidnapped by a Jew to make the matzah bread, to use the, the poor child's blood to make the matzah bread. And it connects to the uh, biblical story of the Passover, of painting the blood over the lintels to, to, to keep your family safe from the last plague and Exodus and Moses. And, so it has uh, religious and, roots to it, but people still believe that's what a, what a crazy myth to me. That's a crazy myth, right? Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. And then, you know, uh, I came back from my trip to Lithuania in 2013. And then I sat in my backyard um, for Labor Day weekend and I had my father and his new wife. Hmm. And um, I told her about this and she said, oh, it's true. Like, what? Oh, no. She's like, well, yes, my my father told me it was true. Of course it's true. And I'm like, oh, well, if your father said so, okay. <laughs> well, it's got to be right. Yeah, yeah, like there's no arguing with that. Oh, man. <laughs> Are there any other uh, either myths or perpetu like discrimina discrimination laws and rules that you remember that were particularly noteworthy? Um... Making them walk, uh, you know, uh, off uh, on the streets and not on the sidewalks. Yes. Uh, the curfews. Right. Um, not letting them go in certain stores. Then, then they couldn't hire Lithuanians to work for them. Right. Um, they could only hire Jews. 
And then they could only sell, like it just kept, you know, narrow, their lives just became narrower, 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 narrower. Um, and then when the Nazis came, I don't think the Holocaust in Lithuania would have happened without the Nazis. There were pogroms here and there, but it wasn't this all out kill every Jew in the country. What that are pogroms? In, what are pogroms? Mm -hmm. Pogroms are um, where people would just rise up against uh, Jews and and kill them, like in a little in little pockets of the of the country. But you're saying that there. wasn't enough, obviously, to stimulate you know a, a genocide. Right, a pogrom is still not a genocide. Mm, right. right, and so, um, so, but because Lithuanians were so primed already by all this anti-Semitic, and it wasn't just the Nazis; like they had a lot of it on their own anyway. And then the Nazis just fed it and refined it. And so, by the time the Nazis came in, um, the Lithuanians were ready to, you know, it, it was like they were hypnotized somehow into believing that every single Jew was bad, and it was for the country's own good to kill every single one because the mother, the woman could create new Jews. See, this is where it gets really horrible, uh, you know, with many other groups that are uh, ostracized. Um, it's not like you want to kill every single one. Somehow with the Jews, they want to kill every single one. What do you make of that? I don't know what to, I think. Um, it goes back to being the, the chosen people and there's just a lot of jealousy. And I think, uh, you know, Jews have been discriminated so for centuries and centuries and whatever little narrow profession they're left with, they excel at. It's all they have, right? And, because it's all they have? What? Because it's all, all they have, have right? Because that's all they have, and they excel at it. And then they get so good at it, they cause even more jealousy because, like, everybody, you know, w when their lives are narrow, people just hope, like, they become miserable and can't stand up for themselves and can't fend. That's what they want to see. Mm. But then when they see that the Jews excel and do really well, then that just gets, it's just envy and jealousy, mm. which is horrible. Instead, what could be replaced with that is admiration. Like, look what you've created with so little. Like, wow, I, I can't do... You're doing more with so little that I can't do with so much. Like, that's incredible. Right. And um, I think in general, like, if Lithuania had all the Jews that they killed, Lithuania would be a powerhouse country. Right. Yeah. You really believe that? Mm. I do. Mm. Well, it's, we won't know. Um do you, what do you think about and feel about Lithuania now? Like, what's the general sense if for you compared to the general population public consensus on how they, they think about their own governance? I don't know. Um, it's still a new democratic country. You know, it's only 30, 31 years old. Okay. And so it's still finding its way. It's a, it's difficult to live in Lithuania, especially when the um, euro came in, and uh, a lot of a lot of Lithuanian lives became even more difficult with the euro. Be they were better off. They seemed to be better off economically with the litas, and then when the euro came in, um, everything became much more expensive. Right. right. And uh, so economically, there's a lot of suffering, like the, uh, the older people, you know, the pensions are like nothing and, you know, like subsist subsistence wages. And so, um, in some ways, you know, it has pockets of being a third world country and, and a lot of people have left about a million people have left in the last 30 years. Do you see that for a better life? being accelerated now still? I don't know what the latest... I, I don't know what the latest numbers are with COVID and all that. Well, 
that makes look i don't i don't necessarily blame them from all you've told me but it's kind of to to close out this conversation sylvia um talking about identity you know i think your book really and this story illuminates how one forms their identity how it's challenged how it's molds how it adapts how has your own family's past and ancestry formed your own identity and what could that teach others about how to interface with their own flawed past and ancestors? I would say um, before I got involved in this project, I, I was a very proud Lithuanian and in, in coming to terms with what what's going on um, I felt a lot of shame over it and why because I have a grandfather you know I at first I had a grandfather who was this big wonderful hero of course and I felt proud about that and then and then I had now I have a grandfather who was involved in killing up to 15,000 Jews. I mean, okay. it's a very shameful thing. But, you know, I my hope is that this book will change things, the narrative of Lithuania's role in the Holocaust. And Lithuania's not the only country with this problem. Um, it's like all the Eastern European countries involved in the Holocaust have this issue to one degree or another because they were uh, occupied by the Soviet Union for 50 years. It's like they never had a chance to look into all this. And, um, and the Soviet Union did not call Jews Jews. They just called them Soviet citizens as well, like to compound the problem. And so um, at this point, I hope that Lithuania will be the first Eastern European country to accept its role in the Holocaust and to be the example to the other Eastern European countries. That would make me a proud Lithuanian again. Do you think you'll see that in your lifetime? I don't know. Wow. One good, one good piece of news yeah. is my book is getting translated in Lithuanian. Nice. That'll open up. Well, how many speak I English? Um, many do, but you know, speaking English and reading a book are two different things. I of think. Co- great. So that'll open up. Now it's just got to get in. It's got to do- get distributed, right? You just got to get eyeballs on it yeah. in Lithuania. Yeah, it should be coming out in February in oh, Lithuania. Beautiful. That I yeah. hope that sends ripples down through. Lithuania. Are you trying to get on Lithuanian um, podcasts and, and news uh, uh, media companies? Like, is that something you're really trying to push or you just let it go and just whatever's going to happen will happen? They're not ready for me. <laughs> uh, you know, they're in Chicago, we have this newspaper called Draugas, like the Lithuanian newspaper, which means friend. They never called me. It's easier for me to get on the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. Than it is for me to get on, you know, those little drogas. They're not ready for me. What was the response of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal? Like, what did that do for you and your story? Oh, it totally ramped it up. I mean, it, it really gave it uh, an international presence. Um, the New York Times put me on the front page. And the Chicago Tribune put me on their front page. And then I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times. And an op-ed most recently for the Wall Street Journal. When was this? And... Huh? When was this? The last one was uh, August 25th. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. So I thought that's why you contacted me, because you read that Wall Street Journal article. That's what I thought. Wasn't the Wall Street... St- How I did... I guess... Um, no, your your publishers are doing a good job getting your name out, right? And that's, oh, really? That's, yes, yes. And uh, that's when I dove into your work. Um, so I, have, but I haven't read that particular piece. Oh, okay. But, oh, um, good. Wait, we got here anyway, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. So, I never, yeah, I never know how it happens. I'm just happy it does. Well, look, now you'll <laughs> look hopefully to some Australians will now hear your story. Like, I think that's what I want to do. I want to spread these interesting stories on history. Like history is so important, right? Yes. Um, I, I don't know. We haven't really talked about it, but I wonder if that's a driver for you, just the an accurate recollection of, of history? Yes, because um, if you get history wrong, you're in danger of repeating it. And so uh, if wow. you don't look at history the way it actually happened and take the cold facts exactly as they happened, chances are you're just going to do the, whole, the same thing all over again because you haven't learned anything. Are you concerned... If you could predict the future, like, let's just say you had to predict, right? And, you know, if you were to be concerned of a past history repeating itself, what would you be most concerned and kind of put your chips into this may occur? I'm concerned about this. If only people knew the history of it. I don't know. You know, there's only 3,000 Jews left in Lithuania. Um, you know, in some ways, uh, by making my grandfather a hero is like is like a is like a second killing of the Jews because they're not accepting what he did. And uh, it's like they're killing them all. It's like the government is just trying to kill them all over again. And um, I, I just hope Lithuania digs itself out of the hole for this. How? How does that happen? It's going to have to. It's going to have to be a big move. It's going to have to be a big harikari move. It's going to have to fall on its sword at this point and say, I'm sorry we got it wrong, mea culpa. What's mea culpa? I'm sorry. I'm guilty. I'm sorry, have, Slanton. Have you? <laughs> no, I like that. I like that. Have you ever seen that happen from the Lithuanian government? No, or... Lithuanians are some very, very proud people. Oh. They're very, very proud people. This is going to be tough, Sylvia. It's going to be tough. This is a tough order. Wow. But that's what they should do. If, if I were their public relations guru. <laughs> How have you been able to reconcile your, your shame that you've had with your grandfather and, and your identity now? Like, where are you at now with that? I feel good talking about the truth. Um, I feel good undoing the narrative of Lithuania. Uh, I feel good explaining that yes, Lithuanians played unfortunately a very large role in the Holocaust. And in some ways, um, this is very cathartic for me. And, and it does help me with that shame. Hmm. It seems like then an antidote to people who are experiencing a lot of shame or embarrassment about their ancestors' past or their parents' wrongdoings, for example, is to talk about it, almost wear it. Like you wrote a book about it, a memoir about it. You, you could not have gone any more full force into it than talking about it on such a public forum. Do you really think that's kind of the antidote to our shame as, as we have with, as being humans? I don't... I think so. I don't, I don't know if it applies to every single subject um you know we talk about dirty laundry airing airing families yeah. dirty laundry yeah and I, and I was i was talking about this with someone and i said you know to me dirty laundry is like uh your grandfather having a drinking problem or mm. like you know maybe having affairs or or god forbid beating his wife like to me that's dirty laundry it's very individual uh but genocide committing gen like t genocide goes way beyond dirty laundry so um 
you know, this argument that, that, oh, you're just airing your grandfather's dirty laundry. I'm like, no, this, this is like, you know, 15,000 people that he was involved in killing. This is not just, you know, he was drunk. Right, right. <laughs> I see you put, that's a, that's a lot, the, the context of those things, like dirty laundry and this, this are very different. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, I, I, it, everything's so specific. So I felt like, Genocide is not something to keep a secret. Absolutely. Are you are you done now? Like the books, the books done. Is there any other work that you're trying to create? Or you're looking forward to creating in the future, or is it just continue to share and spread this message for the rest of your life? I I hope I will be sharing and spreading this for the rest of my life. I mean, I am working on something that has nothing to do with the Holocaust and is just a light thing. Do but you mind sharing? It, is is it like a cooking book or something? No, it's called uh, <laughs> it's called Therapy Dog. <laughs> huh? What's that about? And it's a, it's about um, a, well, I've had a lot of therapy, so yeah. Uh, but I'm not a therapist. But I'm creating a character who's a therapist who has a dog who helps patients open up. Nice. And uh, I'm gonna have the dog um, share his thoughts. And kind of be part of the therapeutic. It's going to be kind of a comedy, um, but the dog's going to get to say things that the humans can't say. <laughs> That's it. Almost sounds like that could be a TV show or something. That I'm kind of envisioning it like that, but I, but I just want to write it as a book, as something light. That uh, you probably need yeah. it after the amount of seriousness that you've gone into for so long, right? That's what I. That's what I need. I need some. It'll be. The therapy dog will be therapeutic for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love that. I love to hear other people's <laughs> like other side projects. But um, Sylvia, th I guess thank you for having the courage to bear your soul and your history and your ancestry and your grandfather like this um, to do this. Because anytime someone is standing up for truth, I, I want to give a small platform that I have to celebrate those people um, and spread their message because... In a world, no, in a lot of, in a world that often tries to stifle the truth, I think we need more people like you. Um, so I appreciate the sentiment and the honesty which with which with you are telling the story. Do Do you have any last closing thoughts, comments, or just asks of anybody listening? I hope you read the book, The Nazi's Granddaughter. Where can I people get it? I hope that uh, if you don't know anything about Lithuania, uh, you're going to learn a lot about it. Um, and it's hard to say. I hope you enjoy this book. Yeah. But because it is a very heavy, it is heavy material. But I hope that uh, you find it worthwhile and that and that it opens up your horizon. I think it will. Sylvia, where can people? buy the book is on amazon can you listen to it on audible have you done the audiobook yeah uh actually a wonderful actress did it uh it's really really well done uh so it is on audible and it's an audio and it's a kindle and nice. it's a hardback now the paperback is coming in june 22nd with a new title new title yeah why'd you do that they uh well they're actually gonna use my original title uh, I did not like this title, The Nazi's Granddaughter. Um, I thought it was too sensational. And I, you know, I'm an English background. And so I was, I wanted something more light and memoirish. That sounds more like a memoir. So the title now is Storm in the Land of Rain. Mm. And Storm is because my grandfather was known as General Storm. And Land of Rain, because Lietuva, Lithuania, translates as Land of Rain. And, um, and then the subhead is, a mother's dying wish becomes her daughter's nightmare. Huh. There you go. I can see you very carefully picked each word. I can, I can hear it in the, it's like that took you a little bit to create. I, yes. The words we use are very important. That's very relevant. I like that title. Yeah, I Storm in the Land of Rain is mine, but the but the subhead Regnery came up with it. Someone at Regnery came up, and I, that was brilliant. I really do like it. That's a good combination, Sylvia. Yeah. Unless you have any last thoughts, thank you so much for your time and coming on and sharing this. 
Thank you so much. I loved being here.